wordpress.com where I have my website. Yay! Okay. Uh, thanks again to SciStrike. And we have Parasad in hand as well as a guest uh, that we're doing the wing it mode in the post um, uh, YouTube deciding to get rid of Google Hangouts thing. And so I will thank you again. And I bow. I am unworthy for all the help that SciStrike has been doing to get things going. Uh, we have, as usual, our continuing dissection of contested bones from a source methods direction. And we're gonna have some delightful discussion of thorium dating. Isn't that hot on everybody's to-do list? And then there'll also be a delightful part two about how creationists don't seem to tell the difference between a dinosaur and a critter that swims in the water. Uh, tornado in a junkyard says, how do I get in on one of these? Oh my, tornado. Well, if, if, um, uh, if Cy wishes to bring tornado in, and send him the link for that and can handle that. We're, we're not entirely sure how many people we have knocking around is the, how, the scale of things. Uh, we may have to be uh, and leave it to another time to, to be uh, uh, bringing in other people. Plus, we don't know whether or not Jackson might be showing up. At some drink. Yes, drink. <laughs> yes, yes. Anyway, um, as usual, the whole point about that source methods thing is that you're not supposed to take my word for it. And you need to, uh, you can investigate. And in fact, I encourage people to do because then you'll learn even more shit than what I had already. Uh, our Rupi and Sanford creationists in that book that was sent to me to analyze um, uh, have a long section where they're kind of dropping their shoes about uh, the radiometric dating thing. And the creationists do not want uh, the radiometric dating to be accurate because suddenly you've got the world being really old and you've got all that millions and millions and millions and millions of years to contend with. So they, they have to dismiss all of this. And they are functionally young earth creationists, but they're really shy so far about alluding to that. They're just casting doubt on the radiometric dating. And one of them is kind of a side swipe, uh, uranium thorium dating, and they're attacking it in relation to how it's used to a potentially date cave art. Because you can have cave art that's like 30, 40, 50, 60,000 years old, and it's, it may be impossible to try to date radiocarbon-wise if there's organic material, although even that, the science has advanced to the point where they can even do that. But uranium thorium is neat because the stuff in the calcite that cruds up the stuff can concentrate tiny amounts of uranium and even in 30 or 40,000 years, there can be enough time, 20 or 30,000 years even, for it to produce some decay products of thorium-230, which is uh, uniquely produced from that decay chain. Now, there's a lot of radioactive thorium naturally, but it's a different isotope, 232. And the vast majority of uranium-232 um, uh, uh, that's around is that other isotope. It's like 99%. And it's also not easily leached into stuff. It, it isn't, uh, the element isn't soluble typically uh, in water. It doesn't dissolve easily. Uh, there are certain odd circumstances where that can happen. And all of this was in the technical papers and stuff that Rupi and Sanford cited, but couldn't apparently read. And, uh, oh yes, don't attend a junkyard. I think you mean dropping their horseshoes as in horse shit. Yeah, that'll do. Um, so this one paper that I put up in there is to an old 19, I guess, 1980s things from the Center for Disease Control. Uh, and they have a thing for potential for human exposure. And it was fun to actually look the bloody thing up because they authority quoted it at one point where they had this one sentence about the presence of ions or ligands that can form soluble complexes with thorium should increase the mobility in soil. And they were authority quoting that to imply that uh, thorium contamination of these rock art things was kind of common and easy to do. The only problem was the whole paragraph. And so if you look on there on the, the page 73, if you're really obsessive about locating the thing, find it dandy, you'll go it down there, is that the whole bit says that uh, thorium will remain strongly sorbed onto soil and the mobility will be very slow. So what little thorium does get in there tends to stay there. And then in the very next uh, uh, sentence, they uh, talked about the contamination of groundwater through the transport of thorium from soil to groundwater will not occur in most soils, except soils that have low sorption characteristics and have the capacity to form soluble complexes. So nothing about this paper was offering credence for the idea that particular cave deposits are naturally going to be uh, contaminated by thorium and worse, 
it would be the thorium-232 that isn't involved in the uranium-thorium dating process. <laughs> so they're, they're screwed up on every single level. The, um, uh, I put another link into a 2001 uh, report on a health fact sheet on thorium where they have a, a much nicer information, more current, where they're talking about the half-lives of the various isotopes and they've got how, what uh, natural abundance uh, and how really not abundant uh, thorium-230 is, um, and uh, also that um, it doesn't easily soluble in water. Well, how the come our dear friends, uh, Ruby and Sanford can't figure this out? Are they lazy or bum, 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 are they cherry picking? And that uh, Rupi only wanted to snatch the little itty bit out there. He never mentions that there's more than one isotope and that they're highly differentiated. So it's a pure matter of data suppression. There's just no ifs, ands, or buts about it. Um, I didn't put a linkage into the a thing that I tumbled onto because I couldn't get full text copy, but in the, it's another example of their misrepresentation because one of their little footnotes was to this uh, 2017 paper, uh, came out finally there, on uranium thorium dating method in Paleolithic rock art, where um, thin layers of carbonate might be trickier to date or questionable. That was their argument. And uh, lo and behold, um, our little pals, uh, Rupi and Sanford latch onto it, giving the web address, not the reference journal. It was the uh, research gate paper to it. The same thing that they did for that, uh, um, another uh, paper that they looked at to that 19, uh, another one on paleo art. They gave a reference to the um, uh, web link, not to the actual bit. So obviously they were, trolling on the internet for this stuff. Well, it turns out if you look at that abstract, there were a whole bunch of commentary things on it disputing this paper. And uh, there was a response by the authors. It means that it's something that uh, may not be quite as up and up, if that may not be as secure as uh, Rupi and Sanford wanted, but they don't bother about that. And um, uh, we were talking a little bit earlier uh, before the show started uh, in the live chat about uh, a, a fellow I'd like to call attention to uh, here um, because it's a beautiful example of source methods. And it has to do with this guy who's currently going under the screen name on Twitter of uh, the Rock Whisperer, Hacking X2. Uh, and he's had several iterations of his screen name. Uh, uh, when he would get burned too much, he would simply change his screen name to something else and then start repeating the same claptrap. He's obtuse on a colossal scale. Um, uh, TD Lane, who's in the live chat there uh, following, he's been one that's been um, observing the phenomenon that's been going on. And I've been having fun jousting along with quite a few others with hacking because he is a perfect example of the Tortukan mindset at its most distilled form. He uh, is ignorant, willfully so, dismissive of science material, constantly demanding people to explain things that he won't answer himself. So he talks about the great unconformity and the Cambrian explosion. He doesn't know diddly about it. And we can't even figure out where he's getting some of his sources from. And he made a colossal mistake in um, linking to, uh, and I alluded to this in one of the earlier evolution hours, if you go back and uh, track that out, um, uh, by David Montgomery. And if you Google David Montgomery in the Noah's flood, you'll probably find links to both the written stuff he's done and also the um, video lecture he did a couple of years ago. And it's wonderful stuff, brilliant stuff. And uh, um, hacking should watch it sometime because he apparently alluded to Montgomery's lecture without having seen it. And then after he decided to see it, he decided it said something it didn't which is defending the global flood and criticizing Nicholas Steno, the uh, uh, 17th century ge uh, geology pioneer, who was a devout Catholic uh, and very, very religious and believed, by the way, in a, in a flood. Um, but uh, he was also one of the founders of stratigraphy and realizing the stuff on the bottom is older than the stuff on the top, uh, that kind of thing. And uh, he's just got obsessions on stuff. And the, uh, uh, the TD Lane says uh, that uh, hacking is extremely obtuse. He, he is the poster child for extremely obtuse. And uh, so he's kind of fun to deal with because it's an opportunity online. And this is how I use the online interactions. I'm not gonna persuade hacking that he's wrong. That's just impossible. He's I like idiot. calling them chew toys. Yeah. 
um, that he's, uh, yes, true, yes, true twice. Uh, it, they're an opportunity for displaying the actual science around people who might bump into it. And so the main thing is, is you don't permit them to ever uh, say a falsehood unchallenged and that you use it as an opportunity to actually bring up science and to discuss things and to hopefully open the minds and, and light the fires of curiosity amongst those watching. Because there are, I think some of the feeds that we're in have like 50 people or so in them. And they, you don't even list all the ones in there. Quite a chunk of them are nit, other nitwits like that. But um, I think these are potentially useful opportunities. And so it's a matter of, of, of keeping your cool and being witty. And uh, advantage I have is I'm a snarky writer and I have a good turn of phrase, hopefully, so that I can, I can turn their words back on them and turn their errors back on them and constantly remind them of their mistakes. Uh, in, in his case, I'm always saying, hey, how, how are you doing figuring out those therapsids? Uh, since I brought I up- I noticed that earlier. Yeah, because I, I, I keep track of when I bring up the reptile mammal transition to the creationists online. And so I could literally say that, oh, well, I brought it up in 2017 with them and they've been ignoring it for all of that time or just from last January, however it is it is. Because since I know the entire data field, um, I am not unconfident if they want to start wading in, very few of them will, hacking won't engage on it. He just dismisses it. Uh, there's another one, oh, um, uh, Genesis 1-1, one, one, uh, W-N-W-O-N, who um, is apparently the wife of Lee Wimberley, who's another creationist online. And uh, they kind of play tag team with each other um, on this, where they one will defend it, and if the things get too hot, then the other one comes in and they bounce back and forth. But they're all phenomenally ignorant, and they will not discuss uh, the reptile mammal transition. Uh, and I, I'm pretty confident that 1-1 one, one, has been drawing off of um, a ricochet off of uh, John Woodmerap's piece at Answers in Genesis because it's virtually the only air quote substantive thing you could find online where a creationist is trying to undermine the reptile mammal transition and it's cockamamie wrong. And so uh, um, she's not gone any further on that, even acknowledging that's where she's getting her information from. So it, it, it's a fun stuff. I'll Anybody admit I have her muted. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I don't mute them. There's only a few people that I, I don't uh, have the spare IQ points to to spend on her. I just I don't. Oh, yeah. Well, remember, I'm doing it in, in conjunction with my tip research. So mm, I'm looking true. to see the connections. Uh, how many people are linking into this? Are there new people that are falling into it? You get um, at the moment, it looks like an awful lot of these Twitter things are in-house interactions of a, of a set group of people, not ones where people are coming in from the outside and joining the conversation and having an additional uh, input there. So it, it's a, a different dynamic that you get from other areas. Um, uh, learning to, to know the, the playing field and how to play around with it uh, is, is one thing, but you don't wanna let um, the creationist or the ideologue ever have an unresponded uh, to falsehood. And that's part of the way they can do that, because if, if they can put out within their followers a statement that is a falsehood and there's no challenge to it anywhere in that thread, then if somebody comes in, they might be more persuaded by it than saying, oh, wait a minute, there's all this controversy swirling around it because there's been a response to it. And you find that in political ideologues and others to where um, hacking in particular will redraft his tweets over and over again to where you, by the time you're answering it, he's already deleted it and he's repeated the same thing a minute or two later. Well, that's another way also of, of trying to generate a non-responded to thread. Mm -hmm. But if you're responding to it real time or as close to real time as possible, uh, they can't get by with that. And uh, it forces them to either just harumph harumph or uh, uh, go down and, and be shut up for a while. Uh, on that. It, it's, it's a fun little thing to deal with. The 280 character limit is pretty useful if you are terse and compact. Um, and uh, also I'm trying to wean more people onto a source methods approach, which is instead of just putting up little meme pics, engage on data floor and discuss stuff and bring up things and, and converse. Uh, in other words, apply your model. And uh, an awful lot of the people, not nearly enough, uh, are moving to a source methods approach. Too many are still operating in the old, just 
snarky thing, in part, I'm sure, because a great many of them are not that well versed on evolution issues to be able to engage on that. And there are some who are more technically minded, but they're also used to looking at it from a data floor level. And it's a new way of approaching it, uh, that to, to have that bottom up approach, then you know when to deploy data floor and then know when to deal with philosophical issues. And um, so you can see how I apply it all if you follow me on Twitter and you can see what fights I pick and what ones I don't. And that's a, an application of how I use the method. Karis, you've been following me on that. What, what's your reaction to how I approach these uh, issues? And here's where everybody finds out that I haven't been paying much attention. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, in, in, the, in the instances where you've been looking at where I've been jousting with creationists online, you're seeing me apply how I like to approach the problem as to what information I like to bring up mm -hmm. and how I like to respond to their points. And I try to avoid anger. I'm not using profanity uh, and all of that. Uh, and and um, uh, have you been finding that in the places where you've uh, been observing that uh, a, a useful approach? That's basically what I'd be asking. I like how you take a very thorough, direct, um, friendly, usually friendly approach. And it's not something that they have anything that they can come back with. Um, they resort to, you know, ad homs or non sequiturs or whatever. There's nothing that they can really come back at you with. Yeah. I mean, and, unlike and you, most, like you said, most people just don't have the knowledge. They there's nothing that they can come back with. Yeah. They have to resort to the meme picks. The um, exactly, well, and that's just... why I'm urging everybody that if you're going to engage with anti-evolutionists or political ideologues or whoever you feel like dealing with, get an area that you know well that you are uber confident on. That's an area that's a point of issue with your opponents. So you can engage with them on an area where you can basically clean their clocks and uh, that you're very, very confident because one of the th reasons why I think an awful lot of people get into that uh, meme pick mode is they, they have a generic view that they're wrong, but they haven't necessarily studied their side very well other than generic or worse, they haven't really studied the creationists opponent argument very well well i think a lot of it actually comes down to just pure frustration and you know just uh, yeah that's really all it is i mean it i i don't know i i think a lot of it is i think it's a lot of it's just frustration on either side i mean on mm -hmm. on our side there are a lot of people who don't have an area that they're uber confident in and that's something that you know they need to be encouraged in including myself i'm in, i'm poster child for this you know there, there's so much that i could be learning right now um there simply well, isn't even, even technical expertise people can have a certain frustration that I've, I've encountered several people on twitter who are scientifically minded and they're gobsmacked that there are creationists in this day and age they're going what because their world that they live in they may be vaguely aware of creationists but they have no sense as to They've not interacted with them directly and in their own world of academics and science work and all that, they've never really tripped into them, especially if they're in areas that are non-biological, if they're paleontology or cosmology and things like that, that they, they, they may never really have kicked into it very much. And, and that's okay because like, well, Beach Price made a joke in the side chat uh, saying I'm uber confident on chocolate, doesn't work well in debates. And uh, <laughs> well, while that's funny, it also highlights that we're just people and we have a wide range of professions, areas yeah. of expertise. I mean, not everybody is going to have any knowledge on science they come here for that um and but remember, and i'm not a scientist i've 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 pointedly corrected some people on here and on facebook uh there was a one with facebook said well down rj is a, is a biologist and i say oh no i'm not i'm i'm i have my ba in history but i read a lot of science and i want to therefore stand up and say this ain't rocket science this is right. basic reasoning everybody can do it Hell, well, I can do it. Yes and no. Where I would detract from that slightly is where people have um, professions or schooling plus family, children, think other obligations that take up, you know, and, you know, the need for sleep, 
some people need that. I don't know if you do. <laughs> but- well, I do too. Uh, and the uh, and I can easily be swamped. I'll tell you that the tip work I do is functionally full time. That I I am doing a hell of a lot of time, eight hour workday or longer. Uh, right. If anybody knows my time schedule, they can see shit. Jim's still up at four or five o'clock in the morning and and, and doing all of that stuff. Uh, and and although I'm doing Twitter jousts on the side, I'm actually also doing book writing and researching and catching up on the incoming data field and occasionally things where I go, oh, this is interesting. You, you may have seen that I'll be putting up, hey, for all of you origin of life groupies, here's this latest article from the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences that you should keep an eye on, things like that. And so there's a lot of balls that I have juggling in the air. And there are some times where I'm going, can I possibly keep up with all of this stuff? Eventually, I, I will need an assistant or more, a group of people that can help collate and organize the material and become uh, an RJ clone that will be able to continue after I've dropped dead, which I will eventually. So this is a long term thing. But the main thing is that you don't need we'll to upload be- your brain somewhere. You'll be here. Uh, uh, in my case, I use an awful lot of tricks to figure out how to keep track of the data field. One thing that I rely on, which is why I bitch about printer ink, is that I like hard copy. And it allows me to sort information in a way that it's so easy to lose track of things if it's being done all electronically. That you, it's, It becomes out of mind, out of sight, because it's a file in a subdirectory of a subdirectory of a section over there. And can you instantly remember where it was? and where you need to find it, whereas a hard copy is a reminder. And it's, it's, a, it's also a physical representation, especially if you make notes on it, which I tend to do, that highlight what the information is. I don't need to print out everything. If it's a really large document, I only need to print out maybe the, the, the main page for referencing, and maybe there's a chart or something that's farther down in the document, and I wanna make sure I have a hard copy of that to see, because that allows me to focus my mind and connect up stuff. And so in effect, I'm creating what the memory people call a memory palace, where you have a a set of things that's like a relationship, a spatial thing to where you can follow and find information and then track down that if need be at the source level. Well, one of the reasons why I keep big focus on keeping my reference bibliography up to speed is because it's way uh, easy to lose track of material, but I can find stuff by text searching my master bibliography. So if somebody says, well, where is that information on supposedly recreating the dinosaur snout from a bird beak? Well, buller, there you go, there's the paper. Uh, And uh, so I can locate that stuff and drop them on them like anvils because I, I, everybody that gets involved with this, if they wanna become serious at it, if somebody says, well, where's your source on that? You should be able to get it. And you should be able to do it with a smile to go, oh, thank you for asking, FUD. And <laughs> now, now, they're in a, now they're in a completely different ballpark because uh, like when one one was saying, well, where's your information on this evidence on these therapsids? Thank you for asking, here's the low paper. So I would lob open access, full text, Lowe, who's a major paleontologist in the field, he did a beautiful review uh, in uh, trends or a, uh, annual review of uh, genetics or something. Uh, in um, uh, 2011, and it just has scads of technical information in there, all of which would need to be explained by the anti-evolutionist. Tackle it, if you will, find an anti. And boy, they go silent in a hurry on that because they can't explain it. Now you've got, and then you, if you keep track of the facts, so I know who I've given these papers to in, in the Twitter links as well. So I can say, excuse me, you have that. You're asking for more evidence. You haven't dealt with the evidence I gave you. Remember the low paper? And now you are operating at a different level than if you're just sticking out a meme pick. And I, I contend it, it forces the creationists to either bluster or shut up. And that's not very impressive unless they, in their little coterie of, of, of Trumpista, NRA, Tortucan creationists, that little narrow cluster that you bump into constantly uh, on Twitter, um, they reinforce one another and they're going to continue to do that. But there are people in the feed that are changing their behavior and bringing in more information, hopefully, by the example that this works. This this operates in a different way than any other approach. 
And it's one that I've showed with Kent Hovind. Uh, um, Kent Hovind had to behave differently around me than he did around other debaters because I'm coming at him from a source methods direction. So I am the evangelical for source methods. It's the killer app. I saw one exchange um, this morning, my time, and somebody, there was a, a, a Christian of some flavor and an evolutionist who was not a Christian in this case, um, but the Christian was asking for uh, evidence of something. The, uh, the other person, the atheist, was saying, well, I am not very experienced in that field and I can't. I don't really have time to teach you over Twitter, but you can go learn it from someone who is qualified. And the Christian had said, well, you can't tell me what it is, therefore, obviously, it's not true. How yeah. do you respond to that sort of um, that sort of exchange? Yeah, in part, the person in question that was... That I mean, it's obviously a bad faith. That the, that the person who had, was at the point where they said, I haven't really studied that much, is already at a disadvantage. They should have been much more wary in getting into an exchange in that area. They were um, pursued, they didn't get into it. Yeah, whereas I don't venture into those areas without a sense of um, my familiarity with it. If people bring up a subject, which they can once in a while, they bring up some topic, some creationist, some little oddball thing that I haven't heard of before, then I funnel it into my maw and I become familiar with it and in many cases can do so in a real time context so that by the time a few more tweets have gone on, I'm pouncing in with a specific on that. And now I've just suddenly strengthened my own argument. So if, if uh, there, there's a wide range of areas where um, anti-evolutionists are tra treading, uh, biology, uh, genetics, um, paleontology, uh, developmental biology, all of that stuff. Plus, if you're in the young earth creationist thing, you'd be talking about geology and astrophysics and cosmology and radiometric dating. There's a, a lot of different disciplines. And when you're getting into religious apologetics, now you're talking about history, you're talking about artifacts, you're uh, uh, talking about uh, scholarly analysis. That's actually a tougher area to dive into because less proportion of those journals of the scholarly journals are actually available easily online than for most of the science topics. Mm. So it, it's actually easier to dive into on, on um, evolution issues. And the reason why I, um, uh, I target a thing I know really well, and uh, obviously the reptile mammal transition was the killer app here because I'd studied all of it to write the damn book. So that means that there's no place that they can go that I'm not already there. And that level of confidence is really powerful tool. Um, don't try to criticize creationists if you haven't read them directly, not because you read Jerry Coyne talking about creationists, that's perfectly fine, but because you actually bothered to read their work directly. And, and uh, um, uh, when they bring up links, uh, gradually you start getting a thing. And also I'll, I'll tell people, feel free to pick my brain bring me in, tag me into the conversation on that. And people have done that before, where some will say, well, I don't know this, but I bet RJ does. And I'll go, oh, actually, yes. And he, and I'll put in the material on it because I've got a level of experience, not because I'm RJ super genius, but because I've been at it for decades and I've accumulated a vast array of material and I have a scholarly method that permits me to collate that information maybe a bit better than the average person who hasn't come from that kind of an experience before. Which kind of says it's okay for you to not know, just bring them to somebody who does. Yeah, and, and seek out the people that do. And, and that's the whole point of, of, of the bigger network of like what a science strike force should be. It's that there's strength in the collective knowledge of the group that everybody gets to listen to everybody else and find people that are knowledgeable in a particular area and gradually build up a nexus of linkages so that you can have, the, there, I have like a, a, a repertoire of maybe a dozen different topic zones where I have some really primary source technical material that I'm at my fingertips can draw on in paleontology and genetics and developmental biology and other areas. And then new ones pop up on the scene because of how Jackson Weed and I have been writing 
uh, the book together and we've been slogging into all the little tendrils of the arguments that are being made by answers in Genesis. And therefore in principle, we're gathering together data field to cover all of their stuff. And so that is adding stuff to areas, so matter what somebody comes up with, uh, quite a while I'll go, gosh, what was that damn paper? What was that damn paper? So I'll open up Slam Dunk and search for the topic matter and go, oh, that's the damn guy's name. Boop, and I'll link that, boop, boop. And all of this takes like about five minutes so that I'm able to, to, to bring to bear the benefit of all the research that I had done previously. Uh, I was at like training wheel level with the old tip, the stuff that's up at the website. Uh, now that I'm into the book writing stage and especially upping the ante with Jackson, we're at a whole new level. And the social media that we interact with on Twitter is a way of seeing what's being the popular tropes of the creationist at varying levels. And you get varying focuses depending on whether they're a bottom feeder uh, that hasn't seen a damn thing, uh, except maybe a, a, a video or something. And then the more technically minded ones that think they're super duper expert, uh, that um, standing for truth falls into that category in the creationist side and the, uh, uh, um, uh, the fellow that Jackson was uh, discussing with from the intelligent design side. These are ones that think they're knowledgeable because they've copied a lot of the primary source stuff secondarily from their apologetic stuff. And then there are much, some who really are now knowledgeable and they should know damn better. Oh yeah. And those are really Jason Lyle. <laughs> people who think they know the, they're, they're jargon tossers. And, right. and anybody, if I if I use terminology, and you've demonstrated this with me, where you'll say, RJ, what, what does that mean? And <laughs> I hopefully explain it, which means I actually understand it because I can turn it into a language for a lay person when I realize, oh, I'm using a technical term. I, can, I should be able to explain what it means in a clear, concise way. If you ask a, a jargon tosser, what does that mean? They're screwed because they don't know what it means. They only know it is jargon. Well, some of them will know the definition of the jargon that they're using, but they won't be able to intelligently apply it. Bing, bingo, that's the next question. And, and a thing that I made in, in my old tip work is the difference, the, the interaction between a generality and a specific. That, there, that if you're lobbying, and this is beyond just the science issue, you find this in politics and other areas, where if you are, uh, offering a generality, you should be able to give specific examples of it. Otherwise, it's just dogma. If you're giving a specific example as like a gotcha point, well, can you draw bigger inferences from that? And does it really mean why you're bringing it up? Uh, so it's a constant interaction between those two levels. And often ideologues are operating at the generality level, hacking does that, or at the specific level, you find that in the anti-abortion debate where um, uh, people will bring up uh, late term abortions or something like that. That's a, a data bit. Well, does that mean you, is that very common? Uh, no. Is that, does that apply to abortions at all across the spectrum? Well, no. And so they're trying to get a generality implied based on an extreme specific. Same thing with immigration policy. You find people talking, and Coulter is constantly ranting on, if any, if any immigrant shoots up a, a store to rob uh, a somebody or beat somebody up, she's touting it instantly, even though the vast majority of immigrants are not lawbreakers. And so they're using it as the squeaky wheel case, but they refuse to make the generality based on it. Well, we're past the half hour, so we better put up my uh, shameless plug uh, a description of uh, patrons so I can thank my patrons. And um, that will be as soon as I see that little image popping up screen from SciStrike, uh, we will be proceeding as directed. And uh, I'll up, up, up with the patrons. Let me type a little note in there. Another thing I want to avoid at all cost is the dead air moment. Uh, people were like, people were talking on. Um, uh, various shows. I think it was on uh, Seth Meyers just a little bit ago about uh, somebody that came from a radio background and how fatal it is uh, to do that. Anyway, so uh, we know it's up on. Yes. 
Uh, and uh, I would like to thank everybody who has helped out in the project that um, uh, we have our colleagues, Hendrel and Eric and Suris and our researchers, Travis and Convert Me and Eat Meal and Ralph and Pelogia, hey Pelogia, and Benjamin and Ugly German Truths and our assistant researchers, Mike and Garanku and James and Puffalophagus and Totes Real and our friends, Daniel and Stephen and Marigail and Insects Are Cool and Morton and Bo and Staggles and Alex and Paul and legacy patrons, people who were helping before, but they, their finances have shifted and they've had to uh, pull back. Uh, uh, but still, I thank you very much. You helped when you could. Uh, Jen and Jody and John and Keith and Andrew and Dyer and Yui and Mona and Brad and Daniel and Nana and Sun and Everett and Sewer and Zeshi. Thank you, every single one of them. And the uh, uh, linkages are in the uh, video description as well to the website where you can find linkages to the books and all the other things, uh, and also to the patreon.com downer dot, uh, uh, slash downer tip, and also gofundme.com dcgo. Uh, lots of ways to help out in any way. Uh, if you've got like a buck a month to spare, that makes a difference. And the more people who help, the more it is. Just if, if you think I'm doing valuable stuff here, think about the fact that flat earthers have lots of supporters on Patreon and creationists have lots of supporters on Patreon. So wooists have lots of supporters on Patreon. Uh, maybe you should be a supporter for me if you feel that I'm doing really valuable work and tell others about the project. So there's my shameless plug uh, for that. Thank you very, very much. And now we can return to the exciting world of part two and the, uh, the beautiful bit of creation is stupid when it comes to uh, paleontology. I always like, I, I, in the course of my tip research, I'm encountering all sorts of delicious stupid as you may have guessed. And so I like to put that as uh, discuss some of those, especially ones where they've got public access papers that you can follow up on your own. And it's often stuff that is uh, a colossally dumb and or uh, really interesting stuff that the colossally dumb creationists don't seem to notice. And this one was one that I had encountered just fairly recently uh, from uh, the August 2019 issue of Acts and Facts. Uh, Tim Clary, who fancies himself a geology guy, and James Johnson uh, decided to trot out this um, dinosaur found in um, marine deposits and how this must have been from the flood. And they even had a quote here, how do land dwelling animals end up in an ocean environment and in ocean sediments? The scientists themselves found no evidence other than their occurrence in marine rocks. And that's a lie because these things are phytosaurs and they're probably a critter you haven't heard of. Uh, it's got a PHY, I'll try to type the thing out here from memory, phytosaurs. I think it's um, one or two T's on, the, on that phytosaur bit. Uh, they're reptile -y little things that aren't dinosaurs. They're um, on the diapsid line, but they're not in that um, group that are belonging to the dinosaurs. And it turns out like a lot of critters that we know in the mammal bunch, like whales and dolphins and seals and manatees, they're, they have aquatic members. And uh, there's been more and more paleontology done over the years to realize that some of them were very aquatic. Crocodiles were in the same boat. Crocodiles today swim around in the water, but they're not flippered. Uh, but there were fully aquatic crocodiles back in the Mesozoic. So knowing all that material uh, counts. And the material that the creationists were riffing off of explicitly are discussing these things. So they are misrepresenting their own cited source material. They've got uh, some stuff from um, a couple 2006 papers um, and uh, I put the linkages to both of those. Neither one of them are supporting their argument. And then I also put in some additional papers uh, from uh, a 2003 paper by Gozzi and Renesto on a complete specimen of Mistriosuchus uh, from the uh, Triassic period. This is in the early stages when an awful lot of reptiles were invading the sea. Uh, dinosaurs were just getting started during that period. And it's only in the very, very late Triassic that they're starting to get a leg up over things. Meanwhile, the Triassic has been a busy time it's marine turtles and the ancestors of uh, plesiosaurs and pliosaurs and ichthyosaurs are all getting into the field in this area. It was a busy time as the ecological systems are changing and the continental shifts are taking place as Pangaea is, is forming and then later on breaking up. 
And then there's also a 2010 paper I put in on the uh, phytosaur habitat. Remember, these critters are in an ecological context. And the papers deal with that in great, great detail. This one has to do with uh, European phytosaur habitats. And there's just tons of neat science going on in here. So if you want to find out about a relatively little known minor critter that creationists can't get their head out of their ass to be able to figure out, uh, phytosaurs will do. So let's see what we got. Um, oh, oh, Reese brings up um, Snowball Earth isn't mentioned in the Bible, fake. Uh, yeah, Snowball, for those of you who do not know what Snowball Earth is, uh, starting in like the 70s and 80s, there was increasing amount of evidence that there was a period on the Earth a couple billion years ago of hyperglaciation, where essentially practically the whole planet freezes over and it's ice, ice everywhere the snowball earth. Uh, volcanoes would probably were a few that were po poking up periodically and warming certain little zones. So maybe a pimply snowball might be thought of uh, as an example. And um, it didn't mean life stopped. Uh, those funky little bacteria were able to get by in a lot of different range. And we know how busy they and habitats they play around with. Uh, and it didn't seem to produce a giant mass extinction uh, although this was way before metazoans and multicellular organisms of worm types and all that stuff is going on. But as that breaks down and the planet warms up again, as the volcanoes start winning and the glaciation starts losing and the planet warms up again, um, you find then when the multicellular organisms are starting to kind of make a coming. And then way later, as oxygen levels start increasing more and more in the oceans from all those little oxygen spewing cyanobacteria and organisms that do that, that are endosymbiotic with them, that eventually reaches the stage where oxygen starts leaking out into the atmosphere too. So that eventually as the Cambrian warms on into the Ordovician, uh, you find oxygen levels are getting higher and higher. And now the organisms that have evolved in the water are starting to invade this new thing so you eventually get plants and all the others uh, and insects and then later vertebrates uh, expanding onto the land in a way that they hadn't before. That's the big, 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 big picture thing. And so there, if you Google snowball earth or um, uh, poke around in that area, you'll be able to get references. I'm sure Wikipedia has a bloody page on it and there will be technical papers on that. And there's continuing research on the matter to where um, it's not a controversial thing now uh, that the planet went through a hyperglaciation phase. So there's a little brief interlude on the exciting world of, uh, of Snowball Earth. It's a, um, it's, uh, there, there's a wonderful book by, oh, good God, the name, uh, uh, Hazen, I think, uh, on, the, on the, uh, the five ages of man, of, of the universe. There's, um, I think it was the, the, the red phase, the black phase, um, the, um, um uh, brown and white and green something like that uh, he's got a color coding system that, that he came up with as a as a rorschach way of remembering um the, the red uh, one um uh, related to the rusting of the oceans when cyanobacteria came along the white part is the snowball earth phase um the um uh, what a blue part is when the um, um ocean systems finally settle in. The black part was in the Hadean phase when the planet was just forming and it was all covered over with crust before the oceans formed and all that. And then the green phase is when living systems really kind of kicked in and started colonizing the land and all that stuff. And uh, oh God, Steve Hazen, I think his name is on it. And he's written a bunch of really wonderful little books and it's, it's uh, well worth it. I think it came out in like 2012. I don't have my bibliography up, so I'm just going by riffing off a of memory here. Okay. Uh, Michael Apple says 756.35 and 580 million years ago. Uh, that was uh, the uh, 635 sounds like uh, the uh, Ediacara biota. Uh, 750 sounds like the end of the um, tail end of that snowball phase and 580 million. That's also in the kind of Ediacara thing. So, uh, Michael, uh, what exactly were you referring to on that? Uh, put a little, little add on as to what the numbers in that uh, what we're bringing up on. And um, do, 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 do. Uh, <laughs> TD Lane, Michael Apple says, I feel like Steve Earle and would be in heaven in the Triassic. Uh, probably so. 
uh, he'd certainly have a field day looking at all the critters that are on, on oh, oh, um, uh, C. Brown is in the field. I will point out that I asked a, a question about C. Brown where he was uh, rattling on about the damn diamond carbo, uh, radiocarbon again. And I asked him point blank, okay, you allegedly have read the paper on radiocarbon by Taylor and Saldon. Uh, please contact them and tell them why you think you know more about their field than they do and let us know. And I will not want to hear anything else from you on that. And of course, C. Brown, who just dithers and dithers and dithers uh, in commenting on my videos, uh, the next thing he started tweeting or, or ref referring to in the videos was not his conversation with Taylor and Savon. So I've uh, uh, junked them. So until you can give an answer on that, C. Brown, uh, you're not making any postings on my videos. I'll throw them in the garbage. Uh, when they come up, because uh, all you're doing is repeating your same tropes. If you have the gumption to contact the authors of those papers, and you can do it, they got emails, that's how I communicated with Taylor directly, you tell him that you know all about why cosmic rays can't possibly form carbon-14 inside of an atom, a uh, diamond, uh, at all physically impossible, and let us know what the answer is on that. No, anyway, uh, back to uh, Triassic reptiles. Um, that, that was a period before the dinosaurs. If you are familiar with the latest paleontology here, you need to have like a mental map in your head of the Triassic, which is a period, relatively short time frame. I think it's like 25 million, 30 million years, something like that. It's, it's, a, it's a smaller time range than the monstrous uh, Jurassic and the even longer Cretaceous period. But um, it's a period when there's a lot of tumult going on in the reptile groups. And there's the uh, one group of reptiles, the synapsids that are on our evolutionary line. They have come off of the Permian mass extinction. They were the dominant uh, land animals and they are losing their edge compared to the other groups. And one of the things that's shown up on the land at least are an awful lot of increasingly bipedal ones that are up on their hind legs and the, the, uh, the hip socket thing is not yet fully vertical in the way that it is in dinosaurs. The dinosaurs are the lineage that, that adapted and found that mutation at just the right point. And they start taking over like a gang of a house on fire in the late Triassic. And they begin to drive all their competition down to where when we move into the Jurassic period, it's a dinosaur world where, where some mammals are crawling around in, in the periphery, but it's basically dinosaurs. It doesn't mean that all of the other rival reptiles go extinct. Uh, turtles didn't go extinct uh, in, on that end of it. Crocodiles and others, in fact, crocodiles diversified enormously during that period. And some of them were absolutely monstrous. Dinosuchus was bloody like 40 or 50 feet long. It was probably a, a small dinosaur muncher. But it is that um, things in the environment shifted. Well, the Triassic is that interesting period where a lot of tumults going on. And you're finding... Um, uh, at the end of the Triassic, there's a big volcanic system that's occurring that start in, in the, uh, the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province. It's called that now, the camp. Uh, at the time, it was in the middle of Pangaea. And it's eventually, it's the first opening zipper as the Atlantic starts opening up. And uh, it's a, a plate boundary thing where it's the equivalent of a mid-Atlantic ridge. So there were volcanic mountains and it was destabilizing the ecosystem as well. And there's a, a, one of the big five mass extinctions, the smallest of the big five mass extinctions is at the end of the Triassic. And it's in part triggered by this central Atlantic magmatic province, the camp. I should type that into the doodad here. Central Atlantic magmatic province. If you look up, um, um, for those of you who still haven't wised up that I've got all this crap at the TIP website for a reason, um, if you go to uh, read TIP 1.2, uh, that has a whole bunch of stuff on mass extinctions. And there's a technical references uh, that relate to the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province and the Deccan Traps and the Siberian Traps and the role of methane and uh, the asteroid impact issue and all of that stuff. I've got a whole bunch of stuff on that. And I, I'm, I, I enjoy, and I keep on updating that periodically, although I haven't updated the main website on it because there hasn't been a lot of 
really major new works in the field in there. But still, uh, I think it's like 2017 or 2018 was the last update on that. And um, there you can find the technical references that will relate to all that. So uh, apparently we've got a side conversation going on uh, with good old um, C. Brown in there. Um, uh, oh, good. Lisa for Truth asks C a really good question. Why is it important to you that the earth be young? And I hope C. Brown will answer that question simply and honestly. Um, I would contend it's because he's been steeped in a young earth creationist dogma that he accepts. And even though that's not what most Christians believe, he thinks that's the only allowable theocratic uh, position to take. And uh, he only pays attention to people who reinforce it. So, and was he always a creationist? Uh, if not, how did he come to be one? Uh, what was the thing that caused him to be so impressed with it if he is a convert in it? Um, those are all legitimate questions that, that uh, I would be curious to know. I don't know if this applies to C. Brown, but to at least some many young Earth creationists, if the Earth is old and evolution, evolution took place, then that means death came to the world by something other than sin, which means that... Um, that there was no need for Jesus to even die and defeat death. And so everything unravels with it. So it's essential for many of them, I'm not saying all, but many for the young earth creationist storyline to be true. Yeah, and it's a relatively recent obsession. It's specifically the young earth creationist obsession that the Jesus Christ sin debt issue, which most Christians simply regard as relating to human beings, and even a lot of them don't think about, is it that hominids didn't drop dead before that? So, and they can think of it as a spiritual death or something, uh, you get variations on the theme. But the specific notion that this death meant everything so that there couldn't have been any animals dropping dead until the sin death, uh, that that's explicitly a young earth creationist position. And you don't find it being defended in intelligent design or old earth creationism. And there's legions of very devout Christians who just don't give it a passing thought and didn't give it a passing thought uh, for centuries and centuries of uh, uh, Christian teaching on this point. But if since it's a non-negotiable in that young earth creationist frame, then they have to cram everything into that no matter what. And so that, that's the drive wheel behind their ideology. They get into problems when they deal with people who extend those non-negotiables in other areas, because exactly that same logic applies to geocentrism. So the geocentric creationists think that they're being scriptural too. And out at the extreme, the flat earther creationists uh, are convinced that this is the, the original doctrine in part because the original cosmology of the Old Testament was flat earth geocentrist. So this is not all that surprising, but yet is nothing more hilarious. And uh, Psystrike Strike has seen this as well, where he, they did one of his uh, movie nights about um, Kent Hovind. Um, the only time where you have to kind of agree with Kent Hovind is when he's criticizing uh, geocentrists or flat earthers. And Answers in Genesis criticizes ge uh, geocentrists and flat earthers. And it's funky to see their sudden selective appeals to natural evidence and inferential logic that they reject categorically when it's applied to evolution and the old earth, suddenly they're using that kind of reasoning when they're trying to flip aside uh, the geocentrists and the flat earthers. So it's, it's from a methods point of view, it's an absolute hilarity to watch. Uh, let's see what else we got going. Yes, uh, TD Lane says creation flurfs. Yeah, it's another one. Um, but anyway, C. Down, uh, oh, C. Brown says, I want to know how I can donate 23 delicious cents to get your fairy tale book published. Where do I send my 23 cents? C. Brown is being snarky uh, that um, uh, nothing prevents C. Brown <laughs> from writing a book and self-publishing it on Amazon just the way I did. C. Brown, you are welcome to go to his Patreon and donate just as many cents as you would like. Exactly. Yes. Don't donate can... too much, though. You don't have much sense to spare, so... No, no, he, he has been uh, uh, insensate as well. Uh, uh, but th this matter of the radiometric dating issue, he's, he's digging a, a line in the sand on this that's just idiot. Uh, clearly, cosmic rays can be filtered out by our atmosphere. The same thing with ultraviolet light and other kinds of stuff. But uh, cosmic rays are really penetrating. And the point is, is that some do- Sounds exciting come onto the Earth's surface. How do you think science found out about cosmic rays? 
You think they only found out about them when they built rocket ships? No, because they're detectable on the Earth's surface. That's how the scientists found out that there were cosmic rays. <laughs> and so um, the idea that a cosmic ray can physically penetrate a diamond, it's like crap through a goose. Uh, they're, they're, they're not as penetrating as neutrinos. Those things go through everything. The Earth is practically transparent to a neutrino. Uh, but cosmic rays uh, can, in fact, slam in through uh, a diamond, and there's nitrogen and other elements that are contaminates naturally in the matrix that form a diamond. And if it hits a nitrogen atom, it can turn it into a carbon-14 atom. Boom! Just exactly as it does in the upper atmosphere with the nitrogen generally. And uh, that happens occasionally, and that's enough, along with the other ways to contaminate uh, a, a diamond, that you can get trace amounts of air quotes carbon-14 uh, that will show up as a date of 80 to 90,000 years, which is completely off the map. You know, 50,000 years is the outer limit of radiocarbon dating, 60 at a push, depending upon how precisely tuned the instrument is. That means that you're seeing microscopic trace amounts involved. And Taylor and Saldon's paper that C. Brown claims to have read explicitly explicitly talks about those very things. And if you follow up on the sources that they do, you could find out about it. And I, to show that I understood what Taylor uh, was talking about, I emailed Taylor and made sure that my understanding of the issue when I was going to be criticizing the creationist was accurate. And Taylor said, yup. And he kindly sent me the full text of his paper and all the rest of the stuff. He's available at the uh, University of California, one of those uh, in there. You can look up his papers, you can see his email address, and you can contact him. And I said to, to C. Brown, the super genius C. Brown, who knows so many disciplines so much better than they do because he's copied stuff out of creationists, to contact Taylor and to tell him all about his notions about how cosmic rays can't possibly contaminate a diamond occasionally and let us know what the answer is. And I would not accept any comments from him until he gives an answer to that question. So, And again, it's perfectly, it's very possible for C. Brown to be very highly intelligent and simply shielding himself from the information that's available. Go check out Google Scholar. Look up this stuff. See how, uh, see how we know this stuff. Yeah. It's, and this is the thing that's so hilarious and sad. It's 2019. It's not 1890. It's not even 2000. I know for a fact, because I am a researcher who don't have a hell of a lot of money, and I am dependent on getting free copies of PDFs and documents that I can download from Academia EDU and these other places because I am not made of money. Even with the thank you, thank you, thank you Patreon people, that's brought me up to the point where I don't have to decide between spaghetti and, uh, and, and ink cartridge uh, uh, in, in a month, uh, as much as I had to before. And paper, I gotta get some more paper because I'm running low on, on paper supply. Fortunately, I got a thing credit back from Office Depot uh, where I can help reimburse that as because of the stuff that I get. Uh, I'm not going around buying Lamborghinis, but anyway, uh, the thing is with the uh, data field is that I know by direct experience how accessible so much of this technical literature is, either directly by Google searching it at one venue or another, or on the website of the journal itself, where typically, uh, even if they're not necessarily open access right off the bat, after a year or so, most of it is accessible that way selected papers in other venues or write the damn scientists and they will nine dollars to a hole in the donut send it to you because they want to give you the information and let you decide and work for yourself they're happy to do that Whoop. go ahead c brown is too lazy to do that katie lane if we evolved from creationists why are there still creationists uh, Reese says, if Americans came from Europe, why are there still, why are there still Europeans? Indeed. Yeah, that's the, the, what I describe as the no cousins rule, that it's, it's the whole thing is they are misunderstanding a whole big side issue. And it's a common trope that just gets repeated over and over again to the point of where uh, the, the monkeys trope, why are there still monkeys? Why are there still primates? You know, get a grip. If my you cousin and I know. came from grandma, why is cram grandma not dead? Well, or the, when, when, I, when you were born, if you have any aunts and uncles and cousins, did all of them drop dead? the day you were born. No, of course not. They have their own separate lineages. And uh, the, it, the chimpanzee could just as well ask, well, if humans evolve from hominids, how come uh, there are still uh, chimpanzees when I'm the chimpanzee? So why is it? Just reverse it. 
uh, and uh, look at it from another area. But this is an area that involves really fundamental conceptual lapses that uh, I've discovered in, in all of these decades of tip research that that whole notion of what it means to have a branching speciation process is a fundamental lapse in anti-evolution thinking. I, I imagine, Karis, in your own personal experience, this was not an issue that came up in creationist apologetics. Um, what was not? The, the idea of, of, of how organisms can branch off through speciation and form lineages that you can identify based on their physical features, what's called morphology, and their genetics to generate no. family trees. And About the deepest we ever got into it was we didn't come from no monkeys. <laughs> yeah, and that's about as far as it goes. And the irony is another advantage of my tip approach where I'm looking at the actual arguments the anti-evolution makes and the actual source material they're relying on is you find out dynamic landscapes that you wouldn't otherwise. But that systematic issue of what's related to what? Is anything related to anything? Creationists theoretically have fixed created kinds. In and which- Tornadoes going EF5 in the side chat. <laughs> oh, oh ha. round face bomb. Oh, really? Maybe because evolution has nothing to do with cosmic freaking rays. Evolution, the limited population genetics, not cosmic rays. Calm down, tornado. <laughs> you did that so well. Relax. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and anyway, the, um, uh, the, the neat thing about all of that accessibility of information is that I want to build that network to where people can gain that information. And there's no excuse in 2019 for willful ignorance. When I was starting out um, in research, it was tough back in the 1980s to find reference material, even if you had access to college libraries, because you go into a college library and you see stack on stack, row on row of journals and books. And how are you going to find what you want? Even if you find Science Magazine, are you going to read through, pick out a volume at random and start reading through issue after issue after issue after issue after issue? There is not time in the day to do that and to track out things. So, so doing technical research in the old days was laborious and extremely difficult. And a lot of anti-evolutionists were able to make hay based on their scavenging of technical literature that were very difficult to track down. And I know this because it was hard to track down. Now that started to change in the internet era when they started putting journals online. And then you could start looking up stuff in a little easier way from your screen, not have to go down through stacks and stacks and stacks and stacks of stuff. You could even at least find abstracts of things to look at in, in the major science journals that were starting to go online. And then we move in the 21st century into the era of the Google searching to where you can do text searches and citation searches in various ways. One of the things that I do typically that's useful is to, to type in most, if not all, of the title of the paper. Sometimes paper titles can be really elaborate and you, uh, and you might not need to type the whole bloody thing in, but you search for that and you find out, boop, first of all, you might find where that you can find the technical paper open access. You should be able to find the technical journal it originally appeared in directly, that primary source. If not, your Google search engine is screwing up. That's always a warning flag. And another thing is to see who may have mentioned it and cited it. That's where you'll often find whether a creationist has cited the work or not, because you'll see creationist references where they've got that title in there. They're copying it slavishly so you can find out who's been discussing it. Quickie, quickie time. And, and that means that you can catch up on the trail of breadcrumbs at a speed that would have just made 1980 me go, and we can all do that. Old farts, young farts. I, I wasn't born in 1980. <laughs> well, there you go. That's the world that has happened just within your own lifetime, Karis. And I don't want anybody to forget how magically spectacular these tools are. Here I am, old fart RJ, sitting in my den with my CD collection behind me that I collected at about the time you were born. Uh, and um, I'm able to do videos that people all over the planet theoretically can see. There are people that are subscribers to the channel in Australia and Europe and all sorts of places. 
and anybody can see them anywhere, anytime they want. And idiots like C. Brown could post anything they wanted until they decided not to answer a plain question flat out, in which case you'll have to wait until you can answer that damn question. And we have access and the ability to put information into the, to the data field. I can put the uh, technical paper reference right in the live chat. Do you realize how amazing that is? It's astonishing. And so what the F are we not using all of those amazing tools to the best of our ability to connect up all of our minds together and expertise? I bump into geologists and physicists and biologists and paleontologists. I follow them on Twitter. Some of them follow me back. There are people who that I found out about because of Jackson's work and Jackson's found out about people because of my work and all of us interconnect and gradually we build up a nexus of linkages to where we can husband our time carefully to pay attention to tripwire people who are the cutting edge people, the website, the blog they do, the particular journal. I always go to Science, Nature and PNAS, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences every week. That's a, a given to keep, catch up with that nexus of science. I don't have to follow thousands of other journals because I can acquire information in those things on the fly as I research the material, just like I did for this phytosaur matter in responding to the creationists, where you look at the creationist piece and then look at the sources they cite, track those down. If they're older, find out what work has been done, sometimes by the same authors, some by others, and pretty soon, in a matter of a few hours at times, you have now a nexus of information that you didn't know about, and now you have ammunition to drop an anvil on the creationist. Now imagine thousands of people all interconnected, each with those skills, making use of that colossal firestorm of information that's out there. Are creationists gonna be able to keep up with us? Hell no. Okay, so I think that's, we've gone past the hour. Um, do you uh, have anything uh, to last to add to uh, a matter, Karis? Oh, I could not follow that. <laughs> I think that sums up what I'm about in this. I don't want to be a one-man band forever. I want to have a, a symphony of people at every level making use of source methods, interconnecting with each other through social media, so that any creationist anywhere in any social media context or in person that you encounter that tries to offer claptrap, you have a way of responding to them or you know how to get in touch with somebody who can has the anvil ready to email to you to drop on them. And they can't play this game. We know from Hacking's case and every other ideologue, the Tortukan mind just doesn't do these things. Otherwise they wouldn't th have the things they do. So I think that's probably about it. We're about ready on here. Um, uh, Korag, uh, I will mention that Korag, um, it says that you don't believe in macro evolution, but you do believe in super evolution. Korag, C. Brown hasn't got to that level. <laughs> uh, he hasn't read enough, as far as I can tell from his dithering, to realize that there's a giant, even though he's heard me, he's been watching my damn videos, he must know that there's a double bottleneck in the creationist mindset as to the created kinds, how many there were, all of those have to generate all the fossil record for all practical purposes and do it super fast because all of that has to take place in the 1500 years from the creation to the flood. Then those same kinds have to, the animal ones have to be on the ark and after the ark have to differentiate into a completely new set of the critters that we see in the existing world with their genes. And even we can infer things about the genes of the extinct fossil forms. Oh, that's a, that's a super duper, super fast thing. They've got speciation on steroids way faster than anything that's observable in the actual record, where all I need to account for the reptile mammal transition and the origin of dinosaurs and the diversification of arthropods in the Ordovician and cephalopods is to know how fast the evolution process works with the organisms we can see and measure at the genetic level today. And that template applied item by item, species by species can connect and connect and connect them layer and layer the dots together. And we can even infer from that the parts that were missing. And then the fossil genie, as I describe him in Evolution Slam Dunk, even comes in periodically and gives a fossil whoop, that matches the evolutionary cue sheet just fine. 
and those prognathic nathans are there. So I will give yet another evolution slam dunk. If you don't have my damn book, why the hell not? It's a great book. I will even show it here. There we go. Evolution slam dunk. Look it up. You Glad know, you Sue Brown, you could always just buy his book if you want to do a one-time donation. Yeah. You can buy it from Amazon. He bought Rupee and Sanford's book because I was criticizing it. And he, in a huff, got Rupee and Sanford, and he's been copying material from its arguments ever since. Uh, and what a clever copyist he is. He doesn't apparently know how to fact check stuff much or read the source material. or And, and he's never acknowledged ever that Rupee and Sanford have ever misrepresented a source. But I've been documenting week after week after week. Half of their technical citations are misrepresenting the content, often blatantly so, to where you can literally see them stepping around the data, as just in this tonight's episode, that conflicts with their point of view. It's not an opinion that that Thorium 230 versus 232 is not mentioned by uh, Ruby uh, and Sanford. It's an observation that they don't do that. Am I supposed to not notice that? Sorry. <laughs> I think Michelle and Lisa both speak for all of us. Michelle says, thank you so much for all you do, James, and all that you share with us. And Lisa says, I love this show. <laughs> I shouldn't say all of us. I mean, I know that there are outliers. Like and Michael has my <laughs> damn book, yeah. and thanks. Uh, I, and thank you for that. Uh, I get my little royalty check. In fact, I got a little royalty check uh, from the, the last month's uh, sales and stuff. And that means I will not have to panic so much when I go up to the store afterwards to get my vittles to see me through for the next week or so on food level. So there we go. And uh, so we're, we're way past the hour on that. I think we pretty well got that underway. Uh, I'm, we'll be here next week and uh, as many weeks as possible as I can. Um, and uh, I want to have more and more people, not necessarily going, oh, well, RJ said it, so it must be true. No, it's that RJ said some stuff that sounded kind of neat, and gosh, this is fascinating, and oh, I think I'm going to research that. I'm going to look that up. I'm going to read that. I'm going to study that, and it's like we're in a banquet. I don't want everybody to starve to death on that. <laughs> okay, so uh, if uh, Cy strikes out there, he can throw up the end thing and we can say bye-bye until next week. There's our patrons again. Thank you very much. That's our NQ. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.